Welcome to the Clinical Podcast Series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. Today's topic is entitled Axial Effect of Combining 0.01% Atropine with Soft Multifocal Contact Lenses on Myopia Progression in Children. I'd like to thank our host, Dr. Dave Kading, our topical expert, Dr. Maria Liu, and our lead topical editor, Dr. Andrew Pucker. And now it's my pleasure to begin today's podcast. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the American Academy of Optometry's clinical podcast series. I am uh, Dr. David Kading. I practice up in Seattle, Washington, and I am here with my good friend, Dr. Maria Liu. Maria, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're at? Yes. First of all, thanks for having me here. My name is Dr. Maria Liu. I'm an associate professor at UC Berkeley School of Optometry. I'm the founder and the chief of the Myopia Control Clinic at Berkeley. Currently, I'm doing, uh, I spent about 40% of my time doing clinical research on the topic of myopia, mostly trying to investigate um, how the different types of uh, treatment works in slowing down myopia progression and axial growth. And another 30% of my time is direct patient care. I work in myopia control clinic on Saturdays. And the rest of my time is for didactic teaching. I teach part of pharmacology and a part of evidence-based optometry. Back to you, wow. David. <laughs> well, what I love about Maria is that you teach, you see patients, and then you research and you bring all of this information to us. And uh, I love how you make uh, such complex data clinically relevant. And that brings us to our topic today. And this paper that we're going to be reviewing is uh, by Jones. It's the effect of 0.01% atropine with soft multifocal contact lenses on myopia progression in children. And Maria, you and I have had conversations about atropine and other types of treatments here. And I want to review this paper and just ask you, I think we all understand this, but why is this important for optometrists? Just kind of give us a 30-second overview of this paper. Yes. So this study actually takes advantage of the study cohort for an existing trial investigating the dose-dependent relationship between the ad power of the multifocal soft contact lens and the myopia controlling efficacy using bioaffinity multifocal off label as the treatment. I personally feel like this is a very important topic uh, for clinicians because it's highly clinically relevant for the following reasons. Number one, regardless of the treatment selected, there is usually a significant individual variability in terms of the anti-myopia efficacy, even among the same study population. So if taking age, ethnicity, and the demographic and geographic characteristics into consideration, the variability is even more significant, for which the performance of the myopia control treatments is usually poor in some kids. Um, so for that reason, the investigation of this potential synergistic effect using the combination treatment is very critical in addressing those who do not respond to the standalone treatment well. Mm. Another point I want to make is that in daily clinical practice, doctors often face the decisions such as, you know, if the combination treatment, if it should be prescribed, if so, when should we consider doing it? If more than one treatment is offered, which one should we start first or both at the same time? So clinical studies on this type of a combination treatment uh, regarding the safety and efficacy is highly clinically relevant to us. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, you see somebody really quickly progressing and you, you may want to make that decision of how do you go. So what were some of the findings in their paper and uh, what, you know, how do we make this uh, relevant for us in clinical practice? So certainly um, in this study, we have three groups, um, two treatment groups and one single vision control groups. Not surprisingly, we're seeing some anti-myopia or axial inhibiting effect uh, from both the multifocal lens group as well as the combination treatment group. And on average, from the three-year adjusted refractive error change, there are about a half diopter change um, in the combo group and a little bit more 0.55 diopter change in the multifocal group. But in the single vision control group, it's significantly larger. It's over slightly over one diopter of change. 
for the three-year adjusted rate. And axial lengthwise, it's about 0.3 millimeter change in the concable group, 0.38 millimeter change in the multifocal group, and 0.67 change in the control group. Yes. So certainly both treatments are offering significant anti-myopia efficacy, much better than the control group. But between the standalone treatment versus the combo treatment, there is no statistically significant or clinically significant differences. So just to, uh, to, to make sure I understood correctly, point, uh, point 0.3 versus point 0.38, was that correct, correct what you said? Yes. Yeah. And that that is not considered statistically significant? Yeah, so based on the variation from each group, um, over three, the course of three years, a 0 0.08 millimeter difference is not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And I think okay. some clinicians may think this is not even clinically significant if it's a three-year accumulative difference. If it's uh -huh. like a you know, difference per year, that may be a um, different story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our expectation would be a 0.1 change in a normal group, right? Over a one year time period. So 0 0.08 over three years, you know, I can see how that, you know, may not be. So uh, what, what was the different effects with visual acuity, pupil size, accommodation? Were those meaningful clinically? So consistent with the other studies utilizing 0.01% atropine, there is a small um, enlargement of pupil size after treatment initiation. Um, but uh, functionally, most kids are uh, tolerating the treatment very well. And uh, in terms of a visual performance regarding visual acuity and accommodation, 0.01% um, atropine had um, like a minimal impact on distance vision, high contrast vision, or near vision. Surprisingly, they're not even finding a significant difference in the low contrast vision um, either, likely contributing to the, the lowest concentration they're using. Yeah. In our clinic, um, if we're using 0 0.02 or 0.05%, the low contrast vision certainly are affected. Yeah. Well, we certainly can see that as well. And those are the, 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 you know, where we prescribe, but it doesn't oftentimes be something that very many of our patients uh, notice. Do you think that it would be worthwhile to do a study like this in those higher concentrations in the future? Um, absolutely. Um, but I do have to say that um, careful selection of the study population is crucial for future studies in this topic. Um, in my personal opinion, only the fast progressors or very early onset myopes should be included in the study. Yeah. Well, there's other studies that uh, compare orthokeratology with the use of atropine. And uh, I believe that they showed a higher uh, clinical or statistical significant percentage than with soft multifocals. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, so um, there are several studies reporting clinically significant and I believe um, somewhat, sorry, statistically significant, but somewhat clinically significant difference between um, ortho K versus ortho K plus atropine. I do have to say that um, these studies are not um, quite comparable apples to apples for several reasons. Number one, the study population had very different risk profiles. And this is largely reflected by the mean change in axial length from the study population. So uh, for most of the ortho case studies, you know, performed in Asian um, population, they have on average of about 0.25 to 0.35 millimeter increase in axial length per year. Versus in this study, the, even in the control group, they only had 0.67 over a three year period. So you can see we're not even testing on the same type of population. And for ortho K studies, all of them had a much higher baseline level of myopia. So um, at least from my understanding, this study actually um, is investigating a, a study cohort that had a much lower progression and a much lower baseline myopia at the treatment initiation. The second difference is the, constant, the difference in the concentration of atropine used. 
and it's usually much higher in other studies. And the third difference is the study design. Obviously, yeah. most of these studies are retrospective, but even in this retrospective, um, like a design umbrella, there are some major differences. Yeah, absolutely. Any closing thoughts or uh, how you uh, have taken this type of information and applied it in the clinic? So um, I'd like to reiterate that the demographic distribution of this study cohort, they have an age, average age of 10 years old at baseline. This is quite representative of the children enrolled in many um, myopia control studies. But um, on average, I think they are, um, David, if you can um, like uh, chime in, this is probably not very representative to the actual clinical population and which is likely, you know, at had a younger age at the treatment initiation and probably a higher level of myopia at baseline. And the second point I'd like to add is that um, this age match design, it's a little bit concerning because the significant individual variability is very multifactorial and the comparability of this change is somewhat compromised in the study design if only age is matched and it's actually doing an age um, range match, not perfectly matching on the age. And um, so uh, I'm hoping in the future we would see more randomized control trials and uh, targeting at those fast progressors that would definitely yield more clinically relevant information for us clinicians, especially dealing with those poor responders to the standalone treatment. Yeah. Well, you and I have spoken about this type of topic on the myopia podcast that we have. And I, I think some of our conversations around this, not to belabor this podcast right here is really around, we want to do everything we can to slow down myopia as much as we can. And I honestly was a little bit discouraged by this data because I was hoping that by doing more treatments, we're going to really, really be able to help slow down the progression even a little bit more. And in comparison to another study that we talked about with orthokeratology, where it may slow it down a little bit more, I was expecting somewhat of a similar result. But you always do a great job of bringing us back to we can't compare apples to oranges in in a, a specifically in a population based uh, study where there's variability to that. And, you know, with fast progressors typically being a little bit younger, this is a little bit of an older population. And so, you know, certainly some some great light on any study that we can have. And if we can see this type of study expanded upon and looked further into, certainly would love to see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, comparing two active treatments and trying to find a statistically significant difference is very difficult, especially if you're doing it in the population where the progression myopia itself is naturally slower. In that population, yeah. it's going to be very hard to find that subtle difference between two active treatments. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great insight. Uh, we know we could talk with you a lot more about this topic. You always bring great insights. Thank you for being on the podcast. Again, thank you for having me here. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us for the American Academy of Optometry Foundation clinical podcast, podcast series. Make sure to like and subscribe and join us again next time for other amazing clinically relevant podcasts. And a special thanks to CooperVision for their educational grant to make it all happen. Thank you.